Doctors are in the business of keeping you healthy. At least they should be. In order to do that, they need to keep tabs on everything that's going on in your body. They might listen to your heartbeat to check on your circulatory system or check out your lymph nodes to learn about your lymphatic system. If you're lucky, they'll hit your knee with that fun little hammer to check on your nervous system. When all your systems are good, doctors don't have much to do. But if one of your parts gets out of whack, things can get bad fast. And next thing you know, you're in the emergency room vying for attention against dozens of other coughing, puking, broken-legged patients hoping the next person you see is a doctor and not the Grim Reaper. Now, our planet is different from people in a lot of ways hurtling unprotected through the vacuum of space being chief among them. But just like our human bodies, our planet is made up of lots of different parts, and they all work together to keep it healthy. And just like our human bodies, disaster for one of those parts can spell disaster for the whole thing. So if we want to keep the planet out of the metaphorical ER, we have to pay attention to all its different parts too. What they are, how they work together, and what happens when they go awry. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm starting to hear the ambulance sirens. Hi, I'm Miriam Nielsen, and this is Study Hall Sustainability. For a second, let's step away from the Earth and its complex problems — climate change, war, poverty, horrible movie remakes — and zoom in on the complex problems of one person. You. When one part of your body doesn't work properly, it can have a domino effect. Like if you're not sleeping well because you're stressed and have a big deadline, your immune system might not be at its best. And if your immune system isn't up to snuff, you're more likely to get sick, which can then cause all kinds of other problems. Suddenly, you're on the couch with a fever and a mountain of gross, snotty tissues. This is because our bodies are made of different but connected pieces that work together to do a job. In this case, the job of being human. In other words, all our interconnected parts form a system. That bodily system is then made of even smaller parts, like your circulatory or digestive systems, which are working together to do a smaller job. They're called subsystems. Our bodies depend on every element in those subsystems to work properly, both on their own and in tandem with the other parts. If one part breaks down, it weakens the system as a whole. And of course, none of these bodily systems would work without the environment around us. Without oxygen or water or food, our systems would collapse. If that weren't the case, some of us would probably have moved to Mars or the Moon by now. But back to Earth, how does this connect to sustainability? Well, like the human body, our world is made of multiple environmental systems that work together to maintain a balance that lets all living things thrive. For instance, imagine a wetland. It's made up of systems that allow life to thrive there, and it all starts with the sun's energy. The sun shines down on that wetland and causes water in its river and soils to evaporate. That water turns into vapor and clouds in the air, where it eventually forms droplets big enough to fall back to the Earth as rain or other precipitation. That precipitation enters the rivers and soil, where it can be used by plants and animals, and the cycle continues. At the same time, the sun also provides energy for plants. Through photosynthesis, plants take in sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide, and then they produce oxygen and glucose. These interconnected physical, chemical, biological, and energy systems, along with all their subsystems, have to work together to sustain the beautiful, diverse life of the wetland. When they're balanced, the sun shines, the birds sing, you get it. But oh, what's that on the horizon? Here come the human-made systems. Human-made systems are things we created to perform functions in our world, like governments, economies, and languages. And they don't exist in a vacuum. Just like our bodies can't function without a healthy environment, our human-made systems don't work without healthy environmental systems either. I mean, we wouldn't exactly have an economy if all the animals, plants, and fungi died, and we had nothing to eat. And it'd be tough to run a government or society without oxygen to breathe or fuel to heat our homes when temperatures drop below freezing. Or, you know, it's just regular cold out. But the arrow runs in the other direction, too. The decisions we make in human-made systems also affect the balance in environmental ones. For example, when people clear land to mass-produce crops, it removes habitats, decreases biodiversity, and increases pollution. Human-made and environmental systems are more tangled up than that pile of extra USB cords you swear you'll need someday. Just like all these cords, they're so connected you really can't have one without the other. Or the other. Or the other. Now, human-made systems aren't inherently bad for the environment. Creating thriving societies doesn't have to mean taking advantage of the other living things around us, or ignoring them completely. For instance, North American indigenous tribes like the Ojibwe have used controlled burns to prevent wildfires. That means intentionally setting fires under specific conditions to burn up dead leaves and branches that have fallen to the forest floor. Controlled burns actually help keep forest ecosystems healthy and diverse. But for many years, the U.S. government, with the help of a bear in blue jeans, was focused on fire prevention and outlawed most intentional fires, which led to a buildup of thick and overgrown forests. 
That means when unintentional fires started, they were way more destructive, dangerous, and hard to control than they could have been. In this case, human and environmental systems have to work together to thrive, because when human systems misunderstand, ignore, or take advantage of environmental systems, things get thrown way off balance. As an example, look at the local economy on the coast of Newfoundland. For nearly 500 years, the cod fishing industry there provided jobs and put food on the table for tens of thousands of Canadians. But as technology improved, it became cheaper and easier to fish in larger areas and in any weather conditions. So fishers were bringing in more and more fish and more and more money. And I mean, they're fish. They've been around for forever, and don't fish lay like a million eggs at a time? They'll all be fine, right? Right? You can see where this is going. Eventually, overfishing and poor management depleted the cod supply to the point of near extinction. The biological system was damaged. To save the species and the industry, the Canadian federal government placed a temporary stop, or moratorium, on cod fishing. But while that may have been a great idea for the cod, that decision also had a domino effect on the human-made economic system. After fisheries collapsed, more than 30,000 people lost their jobs. Local economies tanked, and busy coastal villages became ghost towns all in what was already one of Canada's lower-income provinces. And it didn't really work out for the cod, either. After more than a decade, the local cod population showed no sign of recovery, and the moratorium that was supposed to only last two years has now lasted more than 30. It takes a lot of time and course correction to bring the environment back into balance, if we can fix it at all. But if we keep overusing and overstressing our natural resources, we will reach a point where we've damaged our environmental systems beyond repair. At that point, natural systems won't be able to support life on Earth as it is right now. So let's look at the flip side. What would it look like to think more broadly and make decisions about fishing or anything else while looking at the whole picture? That's what systems thinking is all about. It's considering connections between things, and how one decision could impact multiple systems in the present and future. Like, what if the governments that allowed fishing near Newfoundland had adopted systems thinking before the cod population was near extinction? Maybe they could have made a series of smaller changes that saved the cod without shutting down the industry and entire cities in the process. Or turning the clock back even further, this sort of thinking could have allowed this industry to start on the right foot and be more sustainable from the get-go. Thinking through the costs of our decisions for all systems can help us make choices that are good for humans and the environment. Fortunately, people all over the world are getting behind system thinking including Yu Kongjian, an urban planner who designed cities in China that could prevent flooding. See, lots of areas of China are prone to flooding, especially during rainy seasons. Years of ultra-fast development in Chinese cities have led to rush solutions for managing the environment around urban areas. Like, some cities have concrete walls that are supposed to reduce flooding, but they don't really work. So Yu proposed working with the rivers instead of against them. He removed concrete and planted more plants along the riverbanks. He also designed parks with more drainage and overflow ponds. They're known as sponge cities, and the idea is to soak up rainwater to reduce flooding instead of trying to keep it out with walls. This sponge city approach is good for humans, since Chinese cities have a long history of high death tolls due to urban flooding. And more parks means more areas for people to get outside. And they're also good for the environment, since they provide habitats for wildlife and filter dirty rainwater and return it to the rivers that support aquatic life. So when we think in systems, it helps us get the information we need to make better decisions for the humans and the environment. That said, systems thinking only works if we do something with all those thoughts. And that can be hard, not just because it can involve wrangling people and groups with competing interests, but because there's still so much we don't understand about how the environment works and how environmental systems interact with one another. But we don't have to wait until we have the perfect information to do something we believe will help. Think of it this way. If someone shows up at the ER with a dangerously high fever, doctors aren't going to wait to do something about it until they've run every test they have. They're going to do whatever they can to bring down that fever and stabilize the patient. That's because when doctors go to doctor school, they learn this little phrase, first, do no harm. That means that above all other concerns, they should work to protect their patients. So in dire situations, they take the actions they believe are most likely to help, even if they don't have all the information. And at the 1992 United Nations Convention on Climate Change in Rio de Janeiro, the world decided we should take that approach in sustainability, too. Nearly every country in the world voted to use precautionary measures to minimize climate change, even in cases where the outcome is uncertain. This idea is known as the precautionary principle, and since then, it's become a guiding light for the global movement towards sustainability. We know the Earth is in dire straits, so according to the precautionary principle, we need to act now with the solutions we think are most likely to help before things get worse. Of course, climate agreements come and go, and governments routinely fail to keep the promises they've made for a sustainable future. 
but the precautionary principle gives us a useful lens to look through when we make new decisions about resource and climate management. Just like you only have one body to live in, there's only one planet Earth. And it's the only planet with puppies. That's why it's so important to understand all of its interconnected systems and do the best we can, as fast as we can, to give it the care it needs. If we don't take precautions, even when the outcomes aren't 100% certain, we risk Mother Nature getting so sick that she can't support the rest of us. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full Study Hall Sustainability course and earning college credit from ASU, check out GoStudyHall.com or click the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, tell us if you've ever been to the ER, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching, see you next time.